Good morning. I'm Justin McDonald, Community Engagement Pastor, and we are so glad that you joined us for worship at Geyer Springs. We wanted to let you know that next Sunday, December 12th, is the final week that we'll be collecting toys, coats, and winter wear for the Joy Project. For more information and to give to the Joy Project online, visit gsfbc.org joy. Over the last few weeks, we've been collecting gifts and other items for families from the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home in Monticello. And we are so excited that several of those families are joining us in worship today. One of the other ways that we at Geyer Springs partner alongside the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home is through giving in our Global Missions offering. To hear more on how our giving supports the ministry of the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home, here's Derek Brown. Thank you, Justin. My name is Derek Brown. I'm Executive Director for Arkansas Baptist Children's Homes and Family Ministries. We are so grateful for what you've done at Geyer Springs First Baptist Church through your Global Missions offering. Because of your giving in this unprecedented time, we've been able to provide hope by keeping brothers and sisters together in the same home on our campuses in Monticello and in Harrison. And in this difficult year, we've even launched a new ministry for private adoptions to be able to offer kids in need of a family a permanent home. We're so excited to be able to provide reunification opportunities and adoption opportunities through our foster care ministry, as well as being able to strengthen and stabilize families through our counseling ministry, much of which happens on your campus back at the back of this building. Thank you so much for what you do for Arkansas Baptist Children's Homes and Family Ministries to build, strengthen, and restore Arkansas families for God's glory. Thanks so much, Derek. To date, we've received $129,462 toward the Global Missions Offering. Our goal for 2021 for the Global Missions Offering is $240,000. To give to the Global Missions Offering, visit gsfbc.org give. Whether you're in person or online, we are so glad that you're with us today. Welcome to worship. Well, good morning. Good to see you here this morning. We are uh, online live. We're also live in the venue. Those of you in the venue don't wonder what's up. We're online live and in the venue live for a reason this morning, a special presentation in just a moment. But first, let me welcome you. We are glad that you are here in the worship center. You're here in the venue and you've also joined us online. Let me ask you to take a moment, whether you're in here, in the venue, or online, and register your attendance. You can go that, do that by just texting uh, to 94000. If you're a regular attender, you text GSFBC to 94000. If you're a guest, you text the word DISCOVER to 94000. And that'll register your attendance with us today. Glad to have some of the uh, Young men and young ladies from the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home in Monticello, good to have you guys with us today, and I uh, look forward to having you with us throughout the day as we spend some time together. Well, this morning we do have a very, uh, very special recognition. I'm going to ask Max Pyron, are you in the choir? Where are you, Max? Oh, there he is, Max and Cherry, y'all come on up here. Many of you know this, um, but Max, after uh, nine years here and how many years of ministry altogether? 51 years in ministry, a lot of hair ago, <laughs> Max is, uh, you're, you're retiring but not completely, you're going to continue to do some ministry, but the most important thing is you're moving to Oklahoma to be with your kids and grandkids, and we certainly understand that. It's a great loss for us here, but we certainly understand that. Why don't you hear a few words from some folks about your ministry here? Let's watch this. Well, let's get this straight. This is not goodbye. Just wanted to let you know how much I love you and I'm gonna miss y'all, but we both know you're just a phone call away or a few hours in the car. And I do know you're going where you need to be close to the girls and our grandsons. I'm just so thankful Charlie and I figured out that we needed Summit and got to know you all and had so many fun times together. And then Charlie got sick and I told many people, I don't, I have no idea what I would have done had I not had the two of you. I can so remember you would walk into Charlie's room in the hospital and he'd always managed to raise that hand to greet you. 
Then he lost his battle and we've moved on. And then, oh yeah, who's gonna help us? Who's gonna figure out how to help us decorate for the harvest banquet, the ladies' luncheon, misorganized Sherry? You're leaving us. But you were a good teacher and we had lots and lots of fun. It's gonna be hard without you, but as I said, you're a phone call away and I look for many more adventures together. I wish you the best, and I love you, love you. Oh, and Max, I'm gonna miss you too. Hey Max, congratulations. You know, there are some people in our lives that make us better than we are, and you're one of those people. You helped me to be a better pastor, helped me to be a better man, helped me to be a better leader at First Baptist Church Mountain Home. Speaking of people that make you better, let me just say, Sherry has made you a whole lot better than you are. Sherry, congratulations as well. Wish you guys the best. Hey, you're finally getting to Oklahoma. I know you won't totally retire, but enjoy that family and enjoy those grandkids. God bless, bro. Max and Sherry, when you came for an interview, we were in the middle of the Daniel Fast. and. In spite of that different menu for Saturday night, you determined that it was God's will for you to come to Geyer Springs to serve Him. And you have served so very well. Max, thank you for the Bible studies, for the retreats, the revivals, the road trips, the banquets, the hay rides, the hoot and nanny sing-alongs, and all those wonderful summer suppers at your house. Thank you for the love, the compassion, the guidance that you gave us as we walked through life together. You showed up to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Sherry, you compliment Max so very well, but especially with your creativity. You made all things beautiful with your calm, steady manner. It is hard to let you go. But there's a song that says, friends are friends wherever we are, if the Lord's the Lord of them. You are our forever friend and will remain in our hearts. Today, we cheer with you as we say, go Oklahoma Sooners, we love you. Let me just say that Max <clears throat> has not only been a uh, faithful member of our staff, he has been a dear friend and brother and encourager to me as well. And Max, uh, we've got, first of all, a plaque for you presented to Max Pyron in sincere appreciation for your dedicated years of service to Geyer Springs First Baptist Church. Thank you for your faithfulness, your character, and your heart for the gospel. Thank you. And we thought maybe since you're retired, you might want to start reading the Bible. <laughs> so here's a copy of the scripture signed uh, front and also in the back by all the, uh, the staff members, your friends here at Gower Springs. <laughs> Let me mention that after the service is over down uh, on the main floor here in the lobby, off to the right, there's an area where Max and Cherry will be. You can stop by and speak with them. I believe there are also some note cards on the table if you'd like to write them a note. But we're definitely going to miss uh, Max and Sherry here, but we're so thankful um, while they're still young, you're still young, and somewhat healthy, uh, they can go be with their grandchildren. Let's pray for them this morning. Father, we do thank you for the uh, faithful ministry that Max and Sherry have had, not only here at Geyer Springs, but for 51 years, uh, giving of themselves to the body of Christ to, to edify and to equip and to help the body grow and be mature. Father, we thank you for all that they have done here. God, we are uh, dearly going to miss them. They leave a great uh, void in our staff and in our ministry here, but we trust you with that. And Father, we pray as they go 
um, that all the details that need to take place in, in making a move um, would work out, that the path would be smooth before them. And Father, we pray as they go to Oklahoma uh, for Max to continue in ministry, but more importantly, for them to be around family. I pray that you would help them use the years ahead to make a significant investment in their family. And Father, we thank you for the privilege they have in doing that, and we pray that they would continue as they have done through the years to give you glory and honor in all that they do, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, amen and good morning. Thank you for being here this morning at Worship in the Venue. Uh, before we get started today, I just wanted to, uh, to welcome all of our guests. If you're a first-time guest here today, uh, we want to know who you are. And so directly after the service, I'll be down here. I'd love to connect with you guys and help you with some next steps. If this is uh, your normal place of worship and you are family here, thank you for, for being here today. This is a very, very special day. And we are in December. This is Christmas time. Look at all the decorations up here. Isn't this great? Hey, thank you for the, the team that put this together. This is, uh, this is wonderful. If you go around the church, it's just Christmas, 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 Christmas. And it's an exciting time, but sometimes it's a busy time. I don't know where you're at with your family, um, but we're kind of like moving into that next stage. Hey, we need to go get a Christmas tree. We probably need to start, you know, decorating some things. Some of y'all were like, Thanksgiving's over. Bam, you got it all up. And it looks like it just green and red is just thrown up all over your house. Uh, wherever you're at, this is a new season. And last week we even said that it's a hopeful season. And as we continue in Advent, we just want to re remind everybody why we do what we do and what this place is all about. How many of y'all are like old school um, Christmas movie fans? Like, you know, how the Grinch sold Christmas, like the original one, the cartoon, like Rudolph. Any Charlie ba Brown people in here? Show of hands. Yes. Show of hands. All right, Charlie Brown. Y'all remember the story of Charlie Brown? You got, you got like 10-year-olds that are in charge of putting on a play for the whole community. Great idea. And Charlie Brown, he's like, he's trying to figure out, hey, what are we going to do? Like, we need to get this production going. We need to get it all together. And things just kind of just start tripping him up, tripping him up. And he gets to the end of it, and he's on stage, kind of like I am. And it gets to a point where he doesn't know what the meaning of Christmas is about. And so many times we get to just December 25th and we're kind of like all worked up or in the momentum of just all things Christmas, of buying things, of getting things, organizing things, parties, food. I mean, you're just so crazy. And then we get to the point where we're like, what is this all about? And I remember uh, from Charlie Brown, there's this, uh, this friend, like the unlikely friend, like Linus. Again, he's the kid walking around still sucking his thumb. He's got the blanket. And again, they're like 11 and 12 years of age. You're like, what is this kid doing? And he comes up, he's like, I got the meaning of Christmas. And you know what he does? He turns to Luke chapter 2, and he explains what Christmas is about. So before we get into the hustle and bustle of all things Christmas, let's remember that Emmanuel is God with us. And so in Luke chapter 2, it says this. It says, in the same region where there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night, an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you, and you will see a baby wrapped in swaddling clothing and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was a with with the angel, a great multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Peace among those and he is pleased. You think about this text and you think about Emmanuel, you think about all throughout history getting to this point and God looks and says, this is the time. This is when we're gonna act. I'm going to humble myself and I'm gonna place in a virgin the Holy Spirit to conceive and give birth to Emmanuel, which is God fully flesh and God fully himself. And he would be raised up. And then ultimately what would happen? He would give his life as a ransom. He, he would rescue those. He would reconcile all those who would believe. And we stop and we say, yes, God, this is what this is about. This is what the season is, is about. And we stop and we say, this is why we worship. So this morning, I don't know where you're at in your December walk, but let's remember, we got a lot of things happening today where we're just gonna declare the glory of God and don't miss it. 
don't miss it, that Emmanuel, God with us, has come to seek and save the lost and given us victory over the grave. Let's pray this morning. God, we thank you again for just this time, and we don't want to miss it. So whatever you need to do in our hearts and our minds to get our, our attention on you and to help us to remember what the meaning of Christmas is all about, the meaning of this season is all about, would you now fix our hearts and our minds on that right now? And the peaceful part of this worship service Would you begin to strip off all fear, all anxiety, all agendas, all things to come after the service, and would you just place in our hearts right now a fixed attention on all the things that you're going to do today in our lives. God, thank you. We praise you and we worship you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you guys stand with us this morning?
we sing that this morning, and we believe that, that God is here with us. Um, and it's an incredible thing for us to think about and sing about during this season and during this time of year, as Adam said earlier. And uh, the incredible thing is as we uh, look towards the rest of our service this morning, we're going to be celebrating together uh, in baptism and getting to see life change this morning and hearing about what uh, the gospel does for us individually. And then we're going to get to take in the Lord's Supper, our two ordinances that we practice as a church. You're going to hear Pastor Curtis uh, talk about that a little bit more and, and help us understand that a little bit more this morning. But as we continue to sing this morning, we want to uh, teach you guys, it's a song that's been around for a little while, but it may be new to you, um, that really just focuses in on the, the change of life that happens when we come to know Christ, when we believe in his death, his burial, his resurrection, when he comes inside of our heart, when he changes our life. Uh, this song is about what happens when that takes place. Um, in Romans 8, in Colossians 3, there are several different passage that, passages that talk about this transformation that happens in our heart and how we join with Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and his glory. And so this morning, uh, we want to teach you that song. So I'm going to sing the chorus, and then we're going to see if you guys can sing it back with me. All right, so it goes like this. So I will rise, I will rise as Christ was raised to life. Now in Him, now in Him I live. All right, sing that with me. I will rise and I will.
God, we thank you for that truth this morning, that we can come in your presence. We can sing songs of worship to you and give you all the glory this morning. God, we thank you for this opportunity to worship. We thank you for the opportunity to celebrate life change this morning, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can be seated. If you would, turn your attention over to our baptistry this morning. Hey, thank you guys so much for being here this morning. What a special opportunity that we have. Hey, uh, before I introduce our special baptizee, person who's being baptized, uh, I just want to invite anybody, if you've never been baptized, but you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, man, what an incredible way to just say that, that I am standing with the Lord and I want to be obedient in following him. And so baptism is not something that saves you. Claudia, when, when I submerge you in this water, you are not going to come up and then say, now I am forever walking with Christ because of that decision. Baptism is not something that saves you. This water comes out of a hose uh, and a water heater because we want it to be warm. Uh, but there's nothing magical about this. It is us being obedient to what God has called us to. And so if there's anybody in here today who maybe you have placed your faith and your trust in Jesus, but you've never followed in baptism, I would encourage you. And that is, that is something that is so very important to do. And so Claudia, with that being said, this is my good friend, Claudia Cortez. If you've not met her, she's a hoot. Uh, she is funny. She tells it like it is, which I appreciate. You know exactly what you get with her. That's a lot of students. Uh, but Claudia is, is very special, and she'll tell you how she feels. And so thank you for that, Claudia. She gave her life to Jesus a few years back, uh, and they've been trying to figure out ways to get the whole family here. And they said, you know what? It, it just doesn't look like it's going to work, so we're going to do it. And thankfully, we have technology, and we're streaming this, and the whole world is watching it in a couple hours. And so no pressure, but we're excited to do that and just be able to do that. So Claudia, have you indeed invited Jesus into your heart, and you want to follow him in all that you do? And it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning, worship in the venue. All right. Thank you, my wife, for saying good morning back to me. Appreciate that. She Shelly's here. She with me. I brought the uh, cheering section today, so, uh, so let's get ever along. Uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, uh, turn with me, Matthew chapter 3. And then for those of you who are uh, advanced preparation people, you can mark your spot in Matthew 26. And then we'll wind up in 1 Corinthians 11. So Matthew 3, 26, and then 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, it's been a while since I've been with you in the venue. I've been having some responsibilities downstairs, been out a bit to traveling and stuff. So it has been a while, but it's good to be back with you today. Today we wrap up our series in foundations. Uh, we've been in for a couple of months. It'll be our last week in this. And then uh, we'll move into some Christmas-focused uh, messages next week to bring us up to, obviously, the celebration of Christmas in a couple of weeks. So we've covered a lot. We've talked about the Bible, how we got the Bible, talked about uh, the character and nature of God, talked about Jesus, talked about sin, talked about salvation. Last week, Pastor Dave and Pastor Brad talked to us about the church, the roles, the responsibilities and functions of the church. And as has already been mentioned this morning, today we're going to talk about the two ordinances of the church. And let me first say, if you're military, there's an I in here, and it's a different ordinance than what your background may be, right? Because you're like, what kind of church am I part of? Uh, we get the word ordinance from the word ordain, which means to be uh, decreed or, or something that is appointed or formally established by an authority. And so the ordinances we have are what Jesus commanded us as his church to do as practices to identify, to uh, demonstrate and remind us of who we are as his people. So the two ordinances that the Protestant church will look at and we're going to talk about today are that of baptism and the Lord's Supper. All right. So if you're next Bible trivia round, people say, what are the ordinances of the church? You know, baptism and Lord's Supper, you're going to win that round. All right. So that's where we are with that. Matthew chapter three describes for us and tells us the account of Jesus' baptism. So let's look at this and then we'll kind of uh, springboard on some truths and some principles from this. So it says in Matthew chapter three, verse 13, 
Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John. Now, this is John the Baptist, who's his cousin, to be baptized by him. Now, John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? So now if you've watched uh, The Chosen and have seen some of the interaction with Jesus and John the Baptist, uh, they, they were cousins. And so John recognized who Jesus was. He knew that from the time uh, he was in the womb because when Mary came to Elizabeth, the, the Bible says that John leapt at that. He knew who Jesus was as the Messiah. So when Jesus showed up and said, I want you to baptize me like you're baptizing everyone else, John was like, uh, hold up, this is backward you're the Messiah, you should be baptizing me. Uh, but Jesus says to him here in verse 15, let it be so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus kind of said, this is for us to fulfill all righteousness. We're going to come back to that in a moment. Then he consented. This is John the Baptist. Verse 16, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. If you have your Bible, underline up from the water says, and behold, the heavens were open to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So here we have the baptism of Jesus and we are able to, to see a couple of things here about baptism. First off, uh, Casey mentioned this just a moment ago, baptism does not save you. Okay, he referenced that earlier. We see this here because here's the thing. If baptism were something that brought salvation, Jesus didn't need to be saved, right? I mean, he was perfect at this point. He was going to be perfect as he completed his ministry in the next three years before he died on the cross. Jesus was perfect and had no need to be saved, right? And so baptism does not save us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 say this, for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. So we're saved by grace through faith as a gift that we receive from God. Paul goes on and, and, and just, he drives this point home. He says, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Paul says, we're saved by grace through faith, not of any merit, not of any action or activity that we ourselves would take part in or that we would do. You know, sometimes we, we can, I think we've added to this kind of concept that we're going, Jesus plus blank equals salvation. Well, if you follow Jesus and, and are baptized, well, then you're saved. Well, no, the Bible says if you trust in Jesus by grace through faith, believe in his death, uh, his, his burial, his resurrection from the dead, you are saved through that. It's not believing in Jesus and being baptized. It's not believing in Jesus and going to church. It's not believing in Jesus and tithing or believing in Jesus and serving or doing kind deeds, all of these sort of things. These are all responses to the salvation that we've received as a gift of God by grace through faith. So salvation does not save us, just as it wasn't necessary to save Jesus who didn't need saving. The other very clear example of this from scripture is the thief on the cross. You remember the day that Jesus was crucified and the thief called out to him and said, you know, forgive me for what I've done. The one, the one thief was taunting him and Jesus said what to him? Today you will be with me in paradise. That thief was not baptized before his death, yet Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise. So we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus alone. Baptism then is a step, it's a sign of our obedience to the salvation that we receive. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But also recognize there's only one baptism. This can sometimes be a confusing point for persons and then there's different faith groups and denominations that teach there is one baptism. And to really understand kind of the concept of this, you gotta understand something from the book of Acts. You have the gospels, the life of Jesus and the book of Acts is when the church is being established and when the church is being born. And in this day and time, uh, when the Bible was being written, there were many, many religious leaders and groups that were coming up and there was a new person coming in town saying, God gave me a message and it's this. And so they're teaching and they're establishing different religious groups and all of these sort of things. Well, the religious leaders, part of their responsibility was to ensure that they were protecting God's people from false prophets, false truth, false doctrines, false religious groups. 
because these things were popping up all the time. These new persons coming and saying, follow me, God's got a message. And there was a lot of confusion in this day and time. And so in the book of Acts, as the church is being established, there was this question of, well, how do we know that this is valid? This is a new teaching because they were following the teachings of Jesus and the religious leaders had opposed Jesus. And if you want a good book, and I don't have a ton of time to, to really delve into this day, I'll tell you, 30 years of ministry, this is one of the top three books that I recommend to people to read as believers, particularly new Christians, a book called Accidental Pharisees by Larry Osborne. Accidental Pharisee by Larry Osborne, uh, where he just reminds us that the Pharisees' heart and spirit was to serve God and to do right by him, but they got so absorbed in the legalism and things following their way that when God in the flesh showed up, they missed him. They had convictions that they were living out, but ultimately those convictions led to legalism and they missed the Messiah coming. It's a great book and it's a warning to us as Christians that we don't get so dogmatic sometimes on our convictions and our preferences of our faith that we begin to ostracize ourselves and divide and, and separate ourselves from the biblical community that we need. So the religious leaders, as, as uh, the church is being established in the book of Acts, we see some things that begin to happen in a supernatural way, signs and wonders miracles are transpiring but we see in the early church that baptisms are taking place at pentecost peter preached a sermon it says those who believed and repented that day were baptized and three thousand were added to their number that day philip went and he was preaching philip the evangelist he preached and at the end of his message many came to be baptized and so we're seeing baptism take off but in acts chapter 8 in Acts chapter uh, 13, you see the situation where some, some of the apostles came to a place where people had believed in Jesus and the apostles were there and they were trying to discern whether or not they had followed the baptism of Jesus, the baptism of John. They were baptized and the Holy Spirit came and then they were able to speak in tongues and the biblical speaking in tongues was being able to speak in another language to share the gospel. So you see these things and so people have taught that, well, there's these multiple baptisms. You're baptized for salvation and then you're baptized to receive the Holy Spirit and then you're baptized to, to speak in tongues or maybe you're baptized with a new commission or a new call in ministry. But that's not the case. The Bible says there is one baptism. It's Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 6. Paul says there's one baptism, one Lord, one God and Father who is in all and who is through all. So there's one baptism. And you're like, well, what is all that stuff going on in the book of Acts? Well, I just told you there are a lot of different groups beginning to, to teach things. And so as the early church is being born, as it's being established, God was preserving, God was giving his stamp of approval on the early church to say to the Jewish people, to say to the Gentiles and the world around, this is a work that I am a part of. I have established this. I am overseeing this, I am working through this, and this is going to be my work, my strategy for revealing myself to the world for the gospel to go to the ends of the earth. And we talked about the church and the Great Commission, which gives us the command of baptism. The ordinance is something that Jesus commanded. Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. Then what does he say? baptizing them. Very clear instruction that we are to baptize those who profess faith in Jesus Christ, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. This is Jesus' command. So as the early church is being born, people are like, is it true? Is it not true? This was the first fake news in history right here. Right? People are trying to discern what's right, what's true, what's good, what do we know? Well, God's supernatural empowering of the apostles, him giving of the Holy Spirit, is his way of affirming, I am involved in the church. This is of me, therefore give yourselves to it, be a part of it, and function within the instruction and the direction of this group of believers, the apostles and the ones they would appoint. So two parts of this. There's a descriptive thing that we see in Scripture. Sometimes the Bible describes something, and it's unique, and it's outside of the norm, and God does what God's going to do because God is God, right? So we see a description of something, but that doesn't mean God is prescribing it as something that we should do. And the giving of the Spirit, the speaking in tongues, all of these sort of things, that's not a prescription. That's a description of what was happening in the early church. But once the church was established... There's one baptism, we're a part of that church, we're established, and we begin to function within that once the church was established. That's important for something we're going to see related to the Lord's Supper 
in just a moment. So understand that part of it. There's one baptism that we participate in which identifies us with the local church, the body of believers. And it's from that that we understand these next few things about baptism. First is this. Baptism is by immersion. Baptism is by immersion. You just saw Claudia baptized here. The word baptize itself, that literal word, doesn't mean sprinkling. Uh, it doesn't mean pouring over. It means to dip, to dunk under, or to be immersed. That is what the word means, to dip, to dunk under, or to immerse something. You saw in Jesus' baptism, when John baptized him, it said that Jesus came where? Up from the water. If you come up from, where were you before? You were down in, right? The Bible tells us in John chapter 3 that John baptized where there was much water. You know why he went where there was much water? So people could be immersed. You don't need much water if you're sprinkling or pouring over. The Ethiopian eunuch, when Philip shared the gospel with him and he was saved, the eunuch would have had water for drinking in his chariot. And if he had been to be sprinkled or poured over as a mode of baptism, he could have done that from his chariot. But as they're riding along the road, as he's responded to the gospel, the eunuch said, look, here's water. And he went down, Philip baptized him. And after he was baptized, Philip was taken away in the spirit. Baptism is by immersion. That's why we as a Baptist church practice baptism by immersion. Well, why do we practice baptism by immersion? What does it mean? What does it signify? Well, baptism symbolizes our salvation. Baptism is a symbol of our salvation. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, Paul says, we are buried with him in baptism. Think about that terminology. We are buried with him in baptism. And think about what you just saw with Claudia. The symbol of salvation is this. We are sinners steeped in our sin. We confess our sin to Jesus Christ. We believe that he died on the cross to pay the price for our sin. When Jesus died on the cross, what happened to him? They took him off of that cross, and where did they put him? They laid him in a tomb. And three days later, he was resurrected from the dead, giving new life and saying to those who would believe in him and confess their sins, be forgiven of those sins, that we would have new life in him as well. And so baptism is this symbol of salvation that just as you saw, Claudia, she is confessing to us and to the world that she has died to her old nature, to her sin. She has been buried symbolically to her sin and her old self, and just as Jesus is resurrected from the dead three days later, she is born into new life. And so we get this symbol of our salvation. Thinking about salvation, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6 that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So if we're going to be forgiven of sin through the blood of Jesus Christ, if you are going to be cleansed of that, if you're going to wash your clothes... How do you wash your clothes? With water. Do you spray water from a water bottle on your clothes? Add some soap, let it go. No, you toss it in the washing machine, you get the water. It's this cleansing. When we're baptized by immersion, it symbolizes that we are covered fully and completely by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He forgives us of sins past, present, and future. And so the symbolism becomes so rich when we think about and we see the symbol of baptism by immersion. And so the final thing that we understand about baptism is this, final two things actually. One is baptism is a step of obedience. Casey mentioned this. It's a step of obedience. Jesus went to be baptized by John and John said, time out, this is backward. Jesus said, no, this is to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus is giving us an example of the new covenant that he was establishing. The old covenant had been circumcision. The new covenant is that of baptism. We're identified with God's people through baptism that Jesus would establish for us. He took this step of obedience as an example for us that when we believe in Christ for salvation, we would follow in, in baptism as our very first step of obedience. And I always say this, when we think about obedience to Christ, we're called to a life of obedience the Great Commission, teaching them to obey 
all that I've commanded you. Christ calls us to a life of obedience. If we're not going to take the very first step of obedience in baptism, what makes us think we're going to take the second step or the third step or whatever step beyond that? And also think about this. We celebrate baptism with the body of Christ with believers, people who, who clap and who celebrate and are so excited to see someone taking the step of obedience, if we don't have the courage and the boldness to step out in front of those people to follow in baptism, what makes us think we're going to have the courage and the boldness and the strength to go into a hostile world that may reject, that may persecute, that doesn't want to hear the gospel message? And so this step of obedience is this first step where we're saying to Jesus, Lord, I'm taking this step. And sometimes it's uncomfortable. Part of the reason is as, as Casey baptized Claudia, we so often as pastors, you'll hear us talk to a person about the profession of faith as people are like, don't make me talk in front of anybody. All right. You know, it's like, do I have to get my testimony up there? There's, there's this fear of being in front of people. People are, they're, they're nervous about water and, and being immersed in all that stuff. So it, it can be uncomfortable. It can stretch us. But let me tell you something. Following Jesus is sometimes uncomfortable. It will stretch you over and over and over again. Yet what does Jesus, Jesus call us to? It's a life of obedience. And baptism is that first step of obedience. And finally this, baptism identifies us. It unites us with the body of Christ. It is our way of saying to the world, because Jesus demonstrated this for us and he called us to it, that we are a part of his family, the body of believers. Now, some of you have been looking today, you're like, why is Curtis wearing his name tag today? He's, he's preaching, he's got his, did he forget he's got his name tag on? No, I wore this today because this identifies me as a staff member at our church. If you're here and you're a guest and you're like, man, I got a question on who to talk to, you would start looking for some kind of a name tag, some kind of a shirt, something to identify a person who's on staff. So this identifies me as being a staff member here. And we understand this. You go to Best Buy, you look for the blue shirts or the black shirts if you're looking for the Geek Squad. You go to David's Burgers, you look for the person who yells at you, you know, the that's how you know you, you, the employee there. You go to Walmart and you look, no, they're not helping you at Walmart. So that's, a, um, so that was mean, wasn't it? I, I'll, I, I need to pray. I'll, I'll ask forgiveness for that for Lord's Supper in a minute. But you, you get the idea that, that it identifies us. That's not what baptism does. Baptism identifies us with the body of Christ, with other believers. And so the response that what do we do with baptism is very simple today. If you've never followed in believers' baptism, as Casey mentioned just a few minutes ago, it's time for you to take that step of obedience. What is holding you back from you stepping out, professing, symbolizing your faith in Christ to be identified with his body, to begin setting an example in your life of obedience? And so I'm going to encourage you to do that. Find one of us as pastors. You've seen Adam up here. I've been here. Casey's here. We have other pastoral staff members in our church. You know other pastors. Contact us. We will get you set up. We will begin the process of, of a setting up a time for you to be baptized, to declare your faith and your salvation in Christ. I would also encourage you this. When I was a pastor before, we would uh, actually give out to people who were being baptized. We would give them invitations to fill out, kind of like a birthday party invitation, because here's a great opportunity for you to share the gospel with your friends and your neighbors and your coworkers and your relatives, is when there's a baptism, invite people to come and be a part of it. They may never set foot in a church at a regular invitation, but I'm telling you, you, one of your family members invites them to a baptism, your children are being baptized and they give that invitation to a teacher, to a friend, to a coworker. Those people show up. And I've seen over and over again, people will come and have a great experience. They'll meet people in the church and they'll go, I had a really good time today. And, and they'll have opportunities to engage and talk about the symbolism of baptism and what it meant. And some people even would have a party and be able to share their testimony among their friends and their neighbors who were there. But it's a great opportunity for you to introduce people to the gospel through the symbol of baptism and being a part of a worship experience. So just encourage you, if you have not taken this step of obedience, don't wait. Don't put it off. Why delay your obedience to Christ and your next step of obedience, and your next step of obedience, because God wants to use you. He has plans and purposes for you in your life. All right, so baptism is ordinance number one. Second ordinance we have is that of the Lord's Supper. Flip over to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, this is the account of Jesus with his disciples partaking of the Passover feast. 
This is him doing the Lord's Supper with his disciples just before his betrayal, his arrest, his false trial, and ultimately his crucifixion and then the resurrection. So Matthew chapter 26, we're going to start in verse 17. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, unleavened bread was bread made without yeast. It was harder. Uh, it was flat. It was more of a dry bread. Uh, it was bread that would last longer. It wouldn't begin to mold as quickly. And we'll talk a moment about what that was for. But is this the, the first day of, the, of unleavened bread? I'm sorry, we're in the wrong verse here. We're, that's verse 17, setting it up. I just set the context for verse 26. Now, as they were eating... Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. This is the unleavened bread we just talked about. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of my cup. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And then flip on over to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We just saw Jesus' instruction to his disciples. And then here in 1 Corinthians 11, we see Paul speaking to an early church that was being established and they were having some issues. They were having some problems. I know it's college basketball season and y'all are on the must bus and all that sort of stuff. Well, the Corinthian church was on the struggle bus is the bus they were on, all right? Lots of conflicts, lots of problems, lots and lots of issues. And in the midst of this conflict, the apostle Paul speaks to them about the Lord's Supper. And he admonishes, he rebukes, he kind of casts vision for it, but also he reminds them of a couple of principles related to the Lord's Supper. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, when he, when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Underline that, that phrase that you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is a proclamation of the gospel when we participate in the Lord's Supper. Paul goes on and says in verse 27, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Now, you may have just thought, wait, wait, wait. Did Paul say that some of them partook of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, and they died? Yeah, that's what he said. And now some of you are going, didn't you just say a few minutes ago we're going to take the Lord's Supper today? I think I might pass. <laughs> it's a little nerve-wracking, right? Well, remember what I said about the book of Acts and the church being established and a description as opposed to a prescription of what happens. In the early church as it's being established, God protected his name and his holiness and his righteousness. And he protected that by guarding the purity of the local church. We read the story of Ananias and Sapphira who came and they brought an offering to the Lord and they gave with impure motives and they died at the altar giving their offering. Some of you are like, well, I'm not taking Lord's Supper and I'm not giving, right? <laughs> you like, tell me, they, they die for this sort of stuff. Well, this is God protecting the purity of his church. But as his church was established, uh, God no longer displays his judgment and pronouncement upon sin in that way. We're able to be forgiven of our sin through Jesus as we participate in these things. And so, uh, but this was a warning to the early believers to simply take the Lord's Supper seriously and to examine their hearts and their lives for God to reveal sin that they could confess and be forgiven of. And as we think about the Lord's Supper, just, just very quickly to kind of walk through, Jesus 
partook of this, it was the Passover feast. It was the, the Thursday heading into what we think of as Easter weekend, Good Friday, when Jesus died, his resurrection on Sunday. The Jews celebrated this as Passover feast, remembering their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. You think all the way back to that, all the plagues, the culminating plague was the death of the firstborn. And God told them to make unleavened bread because they were going to travel on their journey. They needed to make it fast, not, let time, not enough time for the yeast to rise, and they needed to take it with them on a journey. So they had unleavened bread. And then they were to kill a Passover lamb, one-year-old without blemish, spotless, perfect condition to kill that lamb. And then they took, and the Bible says very specifically, a hyssop branch. And they dipped it in the blood and they applied it to the doorpost and the top of the door. And when the Lord came through to kill the firstborn that night, because the blood was applied, he passed over and death did not come to those households. It passed over those places. Remember Hebrews 6, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. When that blood was applied, it protected from death. And so the Jews would celebrate this Passover feast all week long, but they would have this meal, the Seder meal. There was a 15-step process to the Seder meal. The food that they had, the bitter herbs that they ate, uh, all the things, the, symbol, the symbolism of their time in Egypt, the deliverance from slavery, the Seder meal is, is powerful. Uh, we don't celebrate in that same way, but if you ever have the opportunity to be a part of, to lead, uh, to do that with your family, we would encourage you to do that. It is a tremendous way to reflect and think about the goodness of God as grace and mercy and to see a picture of of Jesus who came and celebrated this meal with his disciples to fulfill that. One of the things, just just one example of the uh, the Seder meal, is that they, they take the matzah, this unleavened bread, and there were three pieces of it. And they would take the middle piece and they would break it. And they would partake of this middle piece of bread. Now think about three pieces of bread, the middle piece being broken, Jesus with his disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. It's a remembrance of the Passover, but Jesus saying, this is my body broken for you. Now, how many pieces of bread did I say there were? Three. How many parts of the Trinity are there that we saw at Jesus' baptism when he was baptized, the heavens opened up, the, the Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove and God's voice spoke. Three parts of the Trinity, God the Father, Jesus the Son, the middle part, the Holy Spirit in the world working in the lives of believers, that middle part is broken this is my body broken for you. So the symbolism of the Seder meal, Jesus being there with the apostles saying, this is my body broken for you. And then they would eat part of that piece of bread. So just the richness of this, that Jesus says, this is the new covenant. Before it was the animal sacrifices, no longer were animal sacrifices needed. Now it was the new covenant in Jesus' blood. And so receiving of the Lord's Supper symbolizes that we have received Jesus' death, he lived a perfect life, died as our substitute, was resurrected from the dead. And if we believe in him, we too shall be forgiven of our sins and will receive new and eternal life in him. The other component of this is the, the shedding of blood. Remember the branch, the hyssop branch? John 19, 29 tells us that when Jesus is on a cross, they took a hyssop branch. It's very specific. It says it's the hyssop branch. And they took the sponge and they applied it to Jesus' lips to remind us that the blood that Jesus shed on the cross is the blood that cleanses us of our sins. So these two ordinances of the church remind us of one very simple truth. We as God's people are called to live on a regular, consistent basis in the continual transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not a one and done and we're saved and we're on autopilot. We live in the power of the gospel day in and day out because we continue to sin. Remember at the, the Passover meal, the Seder meal with his disciples, Jesus went to wash their feet and they're like, you're not going to wash our feet. Peter in particular, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, unless I wash your feet, you have no part of me. And then Peter's like, well, don't just wash my feet. Give me a whole bath. And Jesus said, you don't need to be cleansed again. Just have your feet washed. He's reminding us that even as believers, we're going to sin. We don't need to be resaved when we sin and then rebaptize all of this again. But when we sin, we come back to Jesus. We confess that sin, and he forgives us and cleanses us of that sin. 
as we think of in the Lord's Supper. So the Lord's Supper is a reminder for us on a regular, continual basis. We practice it about once a quarter at Geyer Springs, and we're going to do that in just a few moments. It's a reminder to us that Jesus has died for us, that we are forgiven, cleansed, and transformed in his continuing work of salvation and of the gospel. So here's what we're going to do. In just a moment, I am going to pray for us. And then we are going to do what Paul said. We're going to take some time in self-examination where you're just going to sit quietly, very reflectively where you are in your seat. And I want you to pray and say, Lord, reveal any sin, any disobedience, any waywardness in my life. And if God brings something to mind, is there, confess that. Thank God for the forgiveness that's available through Jesus Christ. Celebrate the fact that you can be and are forgiven of that sin. And then when you are ready, uh, our, our band's going to come and they're going to play some music and we're just going to have this time of quiet reflection with some music. Once you have spent time in self-reflection and you're ready, we have four stations set up around the room and our deacons are making their way now where you can go and receive the Lord's Supper today to do what Jesus commanded and what Paul said to proclaim Jesus' death and his return. So you can come to the two front tables up here. Our deacons will give you uh, the piece of bread, their, their glove for that portion. Uh, you can take the cup. You can receive that right there at the table, then return back to your seat. There are two more stations in the back, so you can go back there as well if you prefer prefer one of the prepackaged uh, kits for communion. It's got the wafer and the cup. Those are at the back table, so you can go and get the prepackaged there. Just grab that uh, and receive those there. But we want this to be a time where we do exactly what Paul said, what Jesus taught the disciples, that we remember and we reflect upon the salvation that we've received through Jesus' death on the cross of Calvary. And we invite anyone who has believed and placed their faith and their trust in Christ to join us in this. You don't have to be a member of Geyer Springs First Baptist Church, uh, but we, this is, uh, the Lord's Supper is for those who have believed and placed their faith and their trust in Christ. So if you've not yet made that decision but need to do that today, uh, I'll be right down here in the front. You can come, and I'd love to speak with you about that. You can speak with some of our staff after service today. But we want you today to know that there are nothing more important than you giving your heart and your life in Christ, trusting in what Jesus gave us as a picture of his death, his salvation, and the forgiveness of our sins through the breaking of his body and the shedding of his blood so that we could be forgiven and made right with him. So after I pray, you reflect when you're ready, you go and receive the Lord's Supper, return to your seat. We're going to close with a song uh, and then we will be dismissed from there. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for, for the truth that we've seen today, God, just for these pictures, these illustrations and reminders of your goodness to us. God, you came and did for us that which we could not do for ourselves. God, you lived a perfect life. We were helpless to even think about being able to be perfect. God, because we were not perfect or we needed to give our life as a penalty for our sins, according to your word. But God, you came and you did that in our place. You became our substitute so that by grace through faith, we could be forgiven, we could be made new, we could be whole, we could be restored through your death, through your burial and your resurrection. God, we thank you for that gift. And I pray that today that we're reminded that God, because of what you have done for us, now you call us to live for you or to take steps of obedience. Maybe it's baptism. Maybe it's other areas of service, Lord. I don't know what obedience is going to look like for each of us, but I know that you call us to that pattern of obedience. And I pray, God, that today as we search and examine our hearts and we deal with sin in our life, that, God, we're so overwhelmed with your goodness and your grace and your mercy to us that, God, whatever you may be calling us to, that we step out in obedience to accomplish your plans and your purposes and your work in this world. You've given us the gospel, and you've given us everything we need to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. So, Lord, today, help us draw from that strength through that power in the Holy Spirit and accomplish the work and the purposes you've called us to. We ask and we pray this in Christ's precious name. Amen. Let's spend some time in quiet reflection. When you're ready, you go and receive the Lord's Supper today.
Well, amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. Before we dismiss, I have a few invitations for you. First invitation, if you're in here today and you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you need that next step, you need somebody to talk to, you don't know where to go, uh, we're going to be staying up here in the front. And so if you see a name tag, as Curtis was saying, we'd love to have that conversation with you. Second invitation, if you need to get your baptism on the right side of your salvation, or today as you were hearing Curtis speak about baptism and you are you are feeling the Holy Spirit convict you of that and spur you in that, let us say we are ready to celebrate with you. And so if you need somebody to talk to about that, again, come see somebody with a name tag up here. We're happy to have that conversation. We want to celebrate with you that conversation. Uh, the last invitation, if you are a part of a family in here, that's all of us, right? If you are a part of a family in here and you have uh, not had an opportunity to pray with your family lately, just because of all the things that are going on with the season, or if you're in here today and you would like to be taught how to pray with your family, you may have received an email this last week from, uh, from our senior pastor, Dave, and it looked like this. We are encouraging all families to show up here tonight at 6 p.m. in this room to begin a prayer um, just like cast for all of our families. So we want to see our our God move in the, in the lives of our community, but first off, it's got to happen in the home, right? And so dads in here, if you kind of struggle with praying over your, your family and you need some prompts to do that, show up tonight. Wives in here, if you're, if you're ready to step up and to be that prayer support in your kids' lives and in your husband's life, show up tonight. Kids in here, if you've never prayed with mom and dad, and this is an opportunity that is going to be a little awkward for you, we're going to embrace that awkwardness tonight and we're going to pray together. And it's going to be awesome. I promise you it's going to be awesome. That's 6 p.m. tonight. Right here, there is child care available. Uh, but I want to encourage you this. If, you're, if your kid is kind of like old enough to, to be in the room and um, they're old enough to understand a little bit about what prayer is, bring them. And so uh, I'd love to fill this whole room up. And I know that Dave would uh, as well to see this full of families just praying together. And uh, we're going to give you some prompts along that. So don't feel pressure. Like, I've never done this before. don't know what I know. We're going to help you along the way. Okay, so those are three invitations. Hey, salvation right here. Baptism right here. Prayer tonight. Hope to see you all back tonight at 6 p.m. Amen? Well, you guys are dismissed. We'll see you tonight. Thank you so much for joining us online for worship today. We want to connect with you. Hey, if you're a regular attender, we would ask that you text GSFBC to 94000. When you do that, you will get a response back that has things that are going on in the church and just ways to stay better connected. If you're a first-time guest, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, we want you to text DISCOVER to 94000. As a response, you will get more information about ways that you can connect to the church here. Hey, at Geyer Springs, we exist to glorify God by making disciples who love God and love others. One of the ways that we do that in student ministry is by loving students. What we want to do is invite you to join us if you're 7th through 12th grade, Wednesday nights from 6 to 7.30. Thank you so much for joining us online today. Hope you have a great day.